Welcome to the Good Chris Sophian Talks podcast. I'm Levi. And I'm Chris. Thank you so much for joining us this week. On this podcast, we select one talk a week to help each one of us get the Bible in our daily news feed. We post at the start of each week for you to listen with a short intro beforehand to kind of set the stage for the talk you're about to hear. And now, let's hear more about this week's talk. Welcome, everyone, to the 100th episode. Chris and I are here together. Hey, Chris. Hey, Levi. How you doing? Good. We're on, we're on Zoom together, as, we, as everyone in our community has been, it feels like, for the last few months. Yep. Uh, so it's good to see your face. Yeah, happy to, happy to share Bob Lloyd's last exhort. So you were, you were probably in the room for this. Do you remember it at all? Or? I think I was in the room. That's also possible this may have fallen on the week of Idlewild, which I wouldn't have been there for. So I'm not positive, but okay. I vaguely remember it. But as we kind of get into when, we'll, when we talk about his exhort, Uncle Bob has some very consistent themes he uses in his exhortation. So it's possible I'm remembering <laughs> another one that he hit some of the same points. They're still good points. They're still worth rehitting. Right. So yeah, the date here is July 26th, 2015, yeah. which is almost going to be exactly five years to the day, right? We're posting this on July 19th. Yep. Um, and then Uncle Bob passed away uh, six months later. I think it was December of 15. Yeah, he's kind of been a heritage to us for this show. He's episode one, right? And, uh, and I, now... We'll get into the numbers. Episode, he's actually the number one episode, which is episode 74, Don't Worry Over Anything, which we posted in March. Yep. Yeah, that one's got uh, just a, a shade under 1,900 listens, which is is crazy. It's crazy to think of one episode getting listened to that many times. I mean, and, and I don't think, you know, we have not really polled this to figure this out, but I don't poll as in, you know, asking people for to check our facts, but I don't think people listen to episodes more than once. So it's just, to me, it's amazing. Almost 18, you know, 1800 people will listen to one of these episodes. The, episode, the second one is Brian Stiles, which was the next week, the parable of COVID, which, you know, again, that has sent us all into our homes and, and listening to podcasts. Yeah. No, I, one of the things that was crazy about looking at the numbers was that uh, I think a couple weeks back, maybe about a month ago, you had mentioned that we were getting close to crossing the 100,000 total plays mark. Uh, and we're now sitting at 107,000 plays for the podcast. So that's that's basically an average of a little over 1,000 a week or an episode for the, wow. for the 10, for the 100 ones, which first of all, we're, we're incredibly humbled by it. It's crazy to think yeah. of, you know, the all, all the times that people email or reach out or reach out directly about how appreciative they are. And we're just, so thankful that one that it's been helpful uh and that you know everybody is has appreciated it that they've been willing to work with us as we you know it's the first time either of us had done anything like this i know you're you're doing other podcast things that you've done since we mm -hmm. started this one but for both of us right. we were kind right. of going in going in blind with very little experience other than reading and you know studying it a little bit but uh it's been yeah. crazy to see how it's been received yeah, it's clearly a good idea. I don't, you know, we we said it on the one year episode. We, you know, we, you can go back in that one to to listen to us. You know, talk about how the podcast came to be. But I think it's just it has been greatly uh, received, which is which is awesome. And we're so thankful for the yeah the the help we get with submissions, I and mean, also the help the help we're having now with uh, Brian and Rachel Adams mm -hmm. are doing July. Uh, Brother Sam Taylor did July last year. Yeah, we just we we really appreciate kind of the community of, of help that we get around the podcast as well, and so much feedback and advice on different talks. You know, that's helpful. I think our, our email address is well used, and we're we're thankful for that too. Yeah, definitely agree. So yeah, this talk, like you you kind of talked about it. It, it, it. The title is "The Price of Jesus," and he had Matthew twenty seven read. What were your takeaways from this talk? So this is I kind of feel like this exhortation is a quintessential Bob Lloyd exhort. If you've yeah. listened to any of his studies or you've read any of his minute meditations, you will find nuggets and highlights throughout this exhort, especially near the end of his life. Uncle Bob was more prone, especially when he was exhorting, to being a little bit more rambly. He'd sometimes go a little bit mm -hmm. off the the theme that he had stated at the beginning. But it's one of those it's one of those talks where if you just hold on to it and follow it all the way through. Mm -hmm it's all good and you're going to get to the end of it 
one of the points that really jumped out to me that I thought was an interesting way of looking about how to make our walk in the truth really manageable and Uncle Bob was always great at doing this, was he made a point and asked the question, what did you do yesterday that you wouldn't have done if you weren't a Christadelphian? Which Mm. I just thought was a really interesting way of looking at it because he was making the point that like at least every single day we should be doing something that because of our faith, right? So if we're, and and it was one of those things, a lot of times people talk about living a life for Christ and, and living in the way that God wants us to. And it can sometimes seem really daunting to try to, you know, embody that character. And what I always loved about Uncle Bob's talks is he would, he has those real key biblical principles, but then he breaks it down to real simple, practical application to just say like, as long as you can do something every day, you're doing better. Right. Which I feel like makes it much more manageable when you're feeling overwhelmed or like you don't know what to do. Definitely. It's it's always been practical. I think like you're saying, you can, you can really hear the age and, you know, obviously, you know, anyone would say past he's past his prime. You can really, if you listen to it, you can, I mean, you, I can see it so clearly in my mind's eye that he like gets back, he looks back down to his notes because he gets on kind of a topic and gets going and, and then plays some of, the, some of the usual hits that he has. And, and then you can hear him pause and look at, look at the paper and be like, where, where am I going next? And um, <laughs> it, uh, uh, but, but really great. And my, my favorite a takeaway for me, you know, because yeah, again, he had that way of distilling things down to kind of, like advanced concepts being easy, easier to understand. And I'm, I'm going to get this wrong because I didn't write it, write it down exactly, but near the middle of the talk, he says, he says, you can't, uh, you, you, we all know that you will not be saved by your works. You can't work your way into the kingdom, but we also know that you can't get in there if you don't do anything. I thought that was really good. Like it just that, 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 that age old debate. And he's, he's clearly showing, you know, yes, it is, it is somewhere here in the middle. It's obviously not of our own, doing that we can be saved but we won't be saved if we don't do anything so yeah really i I really enjoyed it i think it's a it is a great exhortation lots of lots of different things for anyone to kind of latch onto as kind of you and i have any other thoughts before we before we get into it the only other one that i kind of that jumped out of me i just wanted to to call out because it was one that i know i personally struggle with and you know uncle bob was known for doing his prayer list he mentions it a lot of times right and you know he would mention in he mentions in this talk how if somebody treats him real meanly first thing he does is put it on your prayer list because he makes the point you can't stay mad at somebody if you pray for him. Like it's just Mm, the way our minds work. If you're praying for someone, you can't stay mad. And one of the things that he mentioned, again, just kind of like the practical things that you could really apply to your life was when you're praying, don't be generic or Mm -hmm. systematic, be specific and detailed because he said, you know, because he makes the point, right? If you confess very specifically, like, please Lord forgive me because I accidentally swore yesterday. Right. Mm-hmm. That is putting it in your head and you're confessing that rather than just saying, you know, God, please forgive me for, for I sinned. Right. It's, it's a much more powerful prayer and you're telling God where you're struggling and you're repenting. Right. If you're just doing generic prayers, then you're not repenting for it. But if you're trying to be more specific, it makes it more powerful both for ourselves to work on it. And then, you know, God wants us to be as detailed as possible when we're praying to him. So I, I like that point. It was a good one for me because I struggle with that sometimes. Yeah, I love that. Uh, the prayer list is something that I, I, I need to get back into as well. Uh, yeah, again, an excellent exhortation gets, gets us to a place where we're thinking we need to, we need to step our games up a little bit. Very thankful uh, for this talk and, and Uncle Bob. And thank you again to everyone who listens, uh, who gives us suggestions. We really benefit so much. Thank you again to Brian and Rachel, and they're going to be back uh, for one more class mm-hmm. or one more talk next week. Yeah, th- thanks again. And, th- and thank you, Chris. This has been fun to do this together. Yeah, likewise, Levi. It's been a, it's been a blast. It's been an excuse to, to talk to you more. <laughs> so mm-hmm. I always appreciate it. <laughs> With that, we'll turn it over to Uncle Bob Lloyd for his exhortation on the price of Jesus. The reading from this one was Matthew 27. In case you want to read through that before you hear the talk, that will turn it over to him. I don't move very fast. (laughs) My beloved brothers and sisters of the Lord Jesus Christ, this morning we read this sad chapter. It's one of the most painful chapters, I think, in the whole Bible. It's a hard chapter to read without weeping. Because it tells us how much Jesus suffered for us, for you and for me. He went through this. And we're thankful that he did. And we're here to remember him this morning. 
with the bread and the wine. Now this chapter begins with the story of Judas, who was a betrayer, who takes the 30 pieces of silver, which he'd betrayed, he'd earned from getting Christ killed. He takes it back and returns it. He thought it was so wonderful at one moment, now he doesn't even want it. He paid too high a price for Jesus. What a terrible thing it was to betray the Lord. He'd been with Jesus for three and a half years. He, he knew him well. He knew everything he'd done, all his miracles, and yet he betrayed him. But the question is, what would you sell Jesus for? Would you, would you take 30 pieces of silver? Would you, oh, no, never. Well, that's good. Would you take a million dollars for Jesus? Would you leave the truth for a million dollars? And we all say, no, of course not. And yet, sadly, every day, people are selling Jesus for much less than even 30 pieces of silver. We mustn't sell Jesus for anything. But whatever we spend our time doing, instead of remembering Jesus, instead of doing our Bible readings, instead of living the Christ-like life, could we be selling Jesus? If we're a young person and we're going to school, high school or college, and we have great demands on our time, we have the classes every day, we have projects we have to do, books we have to read, uh, homework we have to do, and so we just don't have time for Jesus right now. That's your price for Jesus if you give him up for school. But you think, oh, that's terrible. But it's happening in this country right now, today. But what would you sell Jesus for? Yeah, people sell him for things that are not really that wonderful. They sell him sometimes for a pet. They have a dog or a cat or even a horse. Or something that takes a lot of their time. They have a dog. It has to be walked. It has to be fed. It has to be taken care of. Well, that's all given. But does it take the place of Jesus in your life? We say, oh, no, never. For some people, they devote their life to an animal. And some young people devote their life to another person. They fall head over heels in love. And maybe they're now, just now married. Or maybe they're still dating. But all they can think about is this one that they've fallen in love with. And as a result, they have no time for Jesus. They're busy. They're taking care of this loved one that they, they admire so much. You see, we, we can sell Jesus for things less important as Judas did. Every time I walk down the street, I see people with a cell phone on their ear. They call them smartphones. But it isn't very smart if you have a phone that takes you away from Jesus. Yet there's people that can't seem to live without talking on the phone or texting all the time. There's a cute commercial that's on the TV about a husband and wife and two teenage girls, and they're standing in line waiting to board a plane. They're going on vacation to some island, and the girls are all with their, their phones. And the father says, well, we have no reception on the island. What? No reception? What will we do? And the mother says, well, you can talk to each other. She says, to each other? You see, people put other things ahead of God and ahead of Jesus. And you sell him if you do. That's, that's the lesson we're learning from Judas. He taught us a profound lesson that we must never forget. Never sell Jesus for anything. He has to be first in our life, not second or third or fourth or fifth. Number one, he said, if you love your father or mother, your husband or wife more than me, you're not worthy of me. Well, we do love our families. We're very fond of our children and our, and our spouses and our, and our parents. But we must not love them more than we love Jesus. That's the point. He must be number one in our life. And so that's the lesson we want to bring from that first few verses of our chapter. Put Jesus first in your life. Make sure that every day you're doing things for him.
So here's a question to ask yourself. What are you doing each day which you would not be doing if you were not a Christadelphian? What is it you do every day because you belong to Christ? He is your elder brother. He is your savior. What, what are you doing? It can't be nothing. It has to be something. Can you think of something you did yesterday just simply because you love Jesus? If you can't, there's an exhortation in that. Let's make sure that every day we do things because we belong to Jesus. We must do our Bible readings every day. What a great shame to miss doing the Bible readings because of things of this life. Does this mean that we're selling Jesus for whatever it was we did instead of doing the Bible readings? Instead of calling on someone who was sick, writing a letter, keeping in touch, praying for them? Do you have a prayer list? We should all have a prayer list. We need to be praying for each other. Jesus said to you, he says you're supposed to love your enemies and pray for them. So do you pray for your enemies? Well, if somebody comes up to me and says, you're a dirty, rotten egg, Right away, they're on my prayer list. Anyone who insults me is right immediately, I pray for them. Because you can't stay mad at somebody you're praying for. You, you may feel sorry for them. You may, you may not like what they said. It may be true. It may not be true. But we're going to look at the trial of Jesus. And they said a lot of things about Jesus that wasn't true. He never corrected them. He never said a word. It was like a lamb led before the slaughter. He was dumb before his years. So let's hope that we, every day, each of us are doing things that we would not be doing if it weren't the fact that we belong to him. Because we won't earn our salvation by the things we do, but we won't earn salvation if we don't do anything. <laughs> That's the point. Be... We have to work out our salvation, but we're not earning it. It's a gift of God. The, the, the reward that's being offered us is so great. There's nothing you could ever do that to be worthy of that reward. He wants to give it to you, but you have to show him that you want it more than anything else in all the world. So how much do you want Jesus in your life? Is he the big part of your life? Do you think about him when you wake up in the morning? Well, we, we say a little prayers before we eat our meals. But, but do, sometimes we, we say them almost by rote. We, we say the same prayer every day. We, we just close our eyes and out it comes. Uh, it should come from the heart. We're talking to God. We're thanking him through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Be, be aware of that. And be thankful for all the blessings that he bestows upon you. Because the one he wants to give you the most is a place in his kingdom. And let's hope that we want that more than anything else in all the world. So Jesus spent his life doing good, healing others. We read about Barabbas this morning. He was a professional sinner, a, a thief, a criminal. He never did anything good, but we know about. And they chose him to be freed. And Jesus to be crucified. What wicked men these were that were doing this to Jesus. And Jesus is showing us how to react when we're being tried. We've never been tried as much as Jesus was. And yet he, he never sinned. Never once. And we all do. I hope you won't be offended, but I'm looking out at a group of sinners. <laughs> but you know, I believe you, I'm looking at a group of forgiven sinners. Because you could go to bed every night with no sin. Because before you get in bed, you get on your knees and you ask God to forgive you your sin. And he promises he will. He does keep his promises. But you've got to mean it. You can't just say the words. You've got to mean it. <coughs> say, I did it today. I'm sorry, but I'm going to do it again tomorrow. You're not, that's not forgiveness. That's not repentance. That's not a change of heart. God has to touch our hearts. Jesus loved us. So much he died for us. And now we must show our love 
by serving him faithfully. So Jesus told us well, how to act when we're being tried. He, he not only told us in Matthew 5, he's now in chapter 27, he's showing us how he did it. He said to us in, back, in the Matthew 5, the Sermon on the Mount, I say unto you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. And pray for them that despitefully use you and persecute you. Do, you. do you pray for someone that offends you? You should. Jesus said to. Uh, people have said some awful things to me in my life. I pray for every one of them. And I release it. I don't think about it anymore. I don't keep it in my heart. Jesus on the cross prayed for those that were killing him. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And they were killing him, and he forgave them. So we, brethren and sisters, are not to defend ourselves in any way. We, Peter, who was one of the, cl the closest disciples that Jesus had, wrote two letters. And in his first letter, chapter 2 and verse 19, he tells us how to act just as Jesus was acting. For this is thankworthy if a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. For what glory is it when you be puffed of your fault, you take it patiently. You, 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 you did something wrong and you get arrested. If you're speeding and you get a ticket, you deserved it, didn't you? Uh, but if you do well and suffer for it, and you take it patiently, well, this is acceptable with God. For even here and too were you called, being Christ, also suffered for us, and we know how he suffered. He was an example for us, says Peter, that we should follow in his steps. And so we read this morning about this painful trial that Jesus went through. And he dies at the end of this chapter. He's dead. It's a sad chapter. But tomorrow is a happy chapter, because tomorrow he's alive again. We knew he was going to be raised, he, because he said he was going to be raised. But some of the people didn't believe it. Now, when he was reviled, he reviled not again, says Peter, continuing. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judges righteously. Who in his own self bare our sins in his body on the tree, that we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness by whose stripes he were healed. We have to be dead to sin. We, we, when you were baptized, what happened? They baptize you. They put you under the water. What if the person baptizing you held you there? You would be dead. But you see, we believe in resurrection. So you go down in the water, your sins are washed away, and you come up a new person, sinless. I love to see new people baptized. So I'm looking at a sinless person. They're going to do it again. We all have. But every night you can get rid of your sins if you just ask God in prayer to forgive them and don't just say, forgive me, says I can feel those sins against me. Name them if you know what they are. Jesus didn't have time to name all your sins. <laughs> but, but if you know, I, I shouldn't have talked to my wife that way today. I'm sorry I yelled at the kids. I'm sorry I told that little white lie. We always color our lives, don't we? They're, when we tell them they're white, when other people tell them, oh, they're black. <laughs> but you may have to, lied to the boss or something. Has to be forgiven for what you did today. Every night, not just at night, but during the day, we can always ask to be forgiven for what we've done. And we promise by God that he will forgive us. What a wonderful promise. And people don't take advantage of it. Some people think they can't do anything wrong. Everything is somebody else's fault. Never my fault. It's always yours. We know we all have faults, brothers and sisters. But God loves us, and that's the good news. And he wants us in his kingdom. So it's natural to defend ourselves when we're being accused falsely, but Jesus did not, and we are not to, to do that either. Jesus lived a perfect life, and no one else has ever done that. But God shows us that it could be done because he had a son who did it. You know, you say, well, I could never be like that. Well, we have, none of us have been. But it's, all, it's because we are giving in to the flesh. We have to fight this every day. It's a constant battle, and it never goes away no matter how old you get. You're still being tempted, and we still sin. 
And we still can be forgiven. That's the good news. So Pilate was trying to distance himself from the people because they just kept saying, uh, they didn't be crucified. So Pilate, when he saw that he could prevail nothing, we just read this, it's in our reading today, but that he rather a tumult was made. He took water, took a basin of water, and he washes his hands in the water before the multitude. He said, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. See ye to it. He knew that Jesus was sinless. Pilate knew that. His wife even warned him in a dream. So he's trying to distance himself. And what, listen to what the people said. We read, just read this. Then all the people said, His blood be on us and on our children. We'll take credit. We want him killed. We'll take responsibility for this killing. That's what they said. Now just follow that down in your mind to when we read the book of Acts. It's coming up soon. And uh, the disciples are now preaching Jesus as the resurrected Christ, Savior of the world. And they arrest him. And they drag him into court. And when they get into the court, they said, did not we straightly tell you not to teach in this name? We told you not to do this. Behold, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine, and you intend to bring this man's blood on us. You trying to blame this for this? What short memories they had. They just said that he, they wanted to accept responsibility. Now they're, now they're denying that responsibility. See how people do? They, they, they sin one day and then the next day. It wasn't their fault, somebody else. Jesus, or Peter responded when they said that we ought to obey God rather than men. And that's what we got to do. We got to obey God and not man. Now, we're fortunate to live in a country where we're not often told to disobey the laws of God. We can obey most of the laws of this country, which we live. It's not true in other countries. In some countries, if you tell them you're a Christian, it's, it's all penalty of death. They chop off your head for saying you're, you belong in Christ. Aren't we thankful to live here? But it's not, there are laws in other countries which Christadelphians break on purpose. In Australia, there's a law that if you're a citizen of Australia, you have to vote. Voting is not an not, not, uh, option, it's a requirement. You have to vote if you're a citizen and you live in Australia. And Christadelphians don't. And so, after an election, the authorities go down the list of people who, who didn't vote and they check to see if they're citizens. And if they are, they contact them. You did not vote. Now, because there are a lot of Christadelphians in Australia, they have made it plain to the government that we do not vote. We do not believe in voting, and we will not vote. And when the authorities look that up, they don't, they don't prosecute us. They, 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 they start to, but they pull back. So even in Australia, they let us get away with that one. But we just, some of us were there. Brother Floyd Elsus just passed away. He was the older brother of Edith McDougall of our ecclesia, who passed away a few days before he did. But when Floyd was a young man, he was of draft age during the Second World War. And he applied for conscientious objection. And his draft board refused to give him conscientious objection status. They ordered him into the army. And Floyd also went to prison. He spent all the rest of the war in prison because he was standing up for Christ and not doing, we ought to obey God rather than men. So, uh, we must be sure that we are obeying God, even if the laws of the land in which we live should, should tell us otherwise. And so, when Jesus was on trial for his life, they publicly accused him of saying that he said that they shouldn't give tribute to Caesar. And he had said, he, he said just the opposite. Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God. And so they misquoted him. They were lying about him. 
Now, if I'd been there on my, my job, I'd say, are you there? Jesus said nothing. He did not defend himself. We don't have to defend ourselves when we're found falsely accused. We just take it. Jesus took it. We must follow Jesus' example, which we read about this morning. And so, uh, Jesus always did what God said. And so, uh, they kept saying, let him be crucified. Crucify him, crucify him. Finally, Pilate says, okay, release Barabbas, a professional criminal, and killed a man who had done nothing but good. He had raised the dead. They knew he had raised the dead. He, he, they knew about Lazarus. They, they, Lazarus was raised from the dead. Did, did it touch their hearts? No. They wanted to kill Lazarus because he was living proof that Jesus had raised a dead man. So get rid of the dead man. Get, make, make him dead again. Fortunately, they didn't kill him, but he was protected. But that was their, their reasoning. They were totally wicked. Brothers and sisters, this world is full of wickedness. We're now legalizing sin in this country. It's okay to do things which the Bible says are not okay to do. We are living in the time of the end. We're living just prior to the coming of Christ. We have a bulletin board in the back about signs of the times. Some of us get signs of the times from England, and I get one from Australia, too. A, brother, a retired doctor in Australia, Brother Wright. And, and the things that they reveal that's going on in the world right now. We're now approving Iran to build an atomic bomb. That's what this new treaty would do. See, it's, this is exciting times, and we got to be ready. And, and uh, we're not ready as we should be, maybe. That's our, that's our exhortation. We want to encourage you. God's not asking you to do what you can't do. He will never try you more than you can bear. No matter what kind of a problem you've got, there's a way out of it. God provides a way of escape that you may be able to bear, may, may be able to bear it. But, but, but you, you've got to turn to God in prayer. And what a friend we have in Jesus, which we sang, my favorite hymn. And Jesus went through all this for you. Now, what are you doing for him? That's the question we have to ask ourselves every day. And it has to be something. But Pilate, after he had called Jesus a just man who had done no good, no, no harm, he ordered his henchmen to scourge him. You know what scourging was? It was beating on the back. Now, the Jews were only allowed to beat a Jew, 40 times. So when the Jews beat a man, they stopped at 39, just to be safe they didn't go over. But the Romans had no rule like that. A Roman person scourging you could keep on as long as he wanted. And many people died from the scourging. And it hurts me to think of Jesus being scourged. His back, back was bloody, from this, this, this scourging. And he was so weak from it that when they led him out to be crucified, he was too weak to carry his own cross. So we're told that they, 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 they compelled Simon to, to, to bear the cross for, for Jesus. So the chief priests and the scribes mock Jesus now when he's on the cross. They, they never gave up mocking him, making fun of him. They knew that he'd raised the dead. They knew that Lazarus was alive. They wanted to kill Lazarus because Lazarus was proof that Jesus had raised the dead. None of them could do these things. What would it take to touch your heart? We know nothing could touch the heart of these wicked men. Nothing that Jesus did touched their hearts. But you see, we, our hearts have been touched. We, we love Jesus, and we love his Father. 
and we want to be in their kingdom more than anything else in all the world. So when Jesus died, oh, before he died, at 9 o'clock in the morning, no, at 12 noon, 12 noon, he was crucified at 9 o'clock, but at 12 noon, three hours on the cross, all of a sudden it went dark. That wasn't like the, the sun went behind the cloud. It went black. There was nothing they could see. You couldn't see your hand in front of your face. And the whole town froze because nobody could see anybody. I suppose some people grabbed lamps and, and lit those. We don't know. But that had never happened in Jerusalem. It happened in Egypt. It was one of the plagues that God put on the Egyptians. The darkness. Darkness that so dark that it's a darkness that could be felt. You could feel the darkness. That's how dark it was. And that was it from, from, from 12 noon, high noon, the sun, high night, all of a sudden, no light at all. It was a miracle. God did it. And of course, it gave his son, son, his son some relief, perhaps, because that sun was beating down on him as he hung on that cross. So the last three hours of his life, Jesus spent in the dark. And I guess it came right again, because they could see again. He said just for three hours it was just what happened. And so uh, he dies. And what happened when he died? There was an earthquake. Do you ever have felt an earthquake? Everybody knows when there's an earthquake if you're in it. Ooh, it's just going like crazy. Everybody in Jerusalem knew about the earthquake. What did the, the, those, those wicked Pharisees and Sadducees do? Didn't touch him. They were not sorry. Not at all. What does it take to touch your heart? Well, thank goodness your heart has been touched because you're baptized. But, but we have to make sure that our heart is always soft and pliable in God's hands. Because the heart, of the, the heart is desperately wicked. And who can know it, said Jeremiah. So our heart is not a good thing from a scriptural viewpoint. But you don't have to give in to it. And you, we, pray, we pray for strength that we will be delivered from temptation that we will not give in to it. So there was an earthquake. But what else happened? Well, the veil of the, trip, the temple was rent in twain. <coughs> no, this, this had hung on curtains. The easiest way to, gra- to, to tear a curtain is to grab it by the top and rip it down. This group. Curtain was ripped from the bottom to the top. It was telling you that God did this and not man. It was a miracle. Again, <laughs> the Pharisees knew all these things happening. They knew about the earthquake. They knew about the, the temple, the curtain being ripped. Did it, did, it, did it affect them? No. They still wanted to, even after they, the disciples were preaching Jesus, trying to blame us for his death. Well, they took blame for it already, didn't they? And so, another thing happened at the death of Christ. Resurrection of people who had already died. Just imagine that you went to a funeral last week. And today, the person whose funeral you went to walks in your house. You'd be astonished, wouldn't you? You'd be moved by that. There were a lot of them. It wasn't just one person. Now, they were not raised for life eternally. They were raised to die again, as those that Jesus raised died again. But Jesus is the first one who ever lived and died and was raised and given immortality. He's the first fruits of those that slept. But we're all going to be eligible for that same gift of God. We all have relatives and friends that we've attended their funerals. And we, we look forward to seeing them again in the kingdom. And they'll be there. We believe in resurrection. We believe that Jesus rose from the dead. We believe that our brothers and sisters who were faithful will be raised from the dead and bestowed with eternal life. What a great hope we have. And we don't we let some, something in this world get in between us and that? We sell Jesus for, for, for something else that's not as important as that? See, he is number one in our life, not number two or three. So we got to put Jesus first in our life. And so now Jesus is dead. 
And where were his disciples? Well, they've all fled. They're gone. So here comes Joseph of Arimathea. He was a disciple of Christ, but secretly. He didn't want, to tell, he didn't want the Jews to know it. But, but now, his Savior is dead. He comes forward and asks for the body. And also a Nicodemus. And so these two tenderly take the body of Jesus and wrap it in grave clothes and bury it in Joseph's own tomb. And he was there three days. And then what happened? The last verses of our uh, reading for today, the Jews, uh, the, the, the wicked Jews, they come to Pilate and they said to Pilate, we remember that that deceiver, they <laughs> were convinced that he, that he was right, that deceiver, he said that he'd be raised in three days. So make just make just lock up that tomb. Make sure nobody can get in and take that body. Otherwise, somebody, they, they may steal his body and say he was raised. That would be a worse problem than we've had before. Pilate says, go ahead and make it sure as you can. <laughs> they couldn't make it sure from the resurrection of Jesus. All the guards around that tomb could not stop Jesus from coming out of the grave. Do you believe that Jesus actually rose from the dead? Do you believe that he's coming back? Do you, do you believe it's soon? I believe it's real soon. I, I've been expecting it so many years, but I, there's more signs of the times now. All in place. I, I almost wonder why we're still here now. It looks like there's not very much left. We know that Damascus has to be destroyed. But uh, whether we're not sure whether it's before or after Christ comes. But uh, it could be, it's pretty much in shambles now. But, but he's coming. And you're going to be there. And, and young people, if you are old enough to know what you're supposed to do, you're going to be there. Even if you haven't listened to him, you're going to be there. Because knowledge brings responsibility. When we know what's right to do, we don't have a choice. We must do it. We must try our best. Brothers, and Jesus will help us. He wants you in his kingdom. He's rooting for you. His father is rooting for you. And if you don't want it because something else has come in the way, whatever that something else is, is your price for Jesus. So brothers and sisters, we must not sell Jesus for anything. He is the most important person in your life. He's coming soon. We pray we'll be ready when he comes. When I was a little boy, I loved to play the game hide and go seek. I haven't played it for years. But maybe you all have played it sometime. And the person, it's it, hides their eyes. And he counts. And everybody else runs and hides. And as he gets through counting to the prescribed number, he takes his arm away. He says, here I come, ready or not. Jesus is coming. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Thank you for listening to the Good Christadelphian Talks podcast. Please subscribe for new episodes and leave a review on Apple Podcasts or whichever service you are listening from to help people find the show when they search for it. If you enjoyed this talk, share it on social media so other people can find it too. For show notes and links to the talk that you just listened to, visit our show page at anchor.fm slash gct. We want to encourage everyone to share their thoughts from the talk this week on Facebook or Instagram, where we are at Good Christadelphian Talks or on Twitter, where we are at GCT underscore podcast. If you know of a great talk, we want to know about it too. Send a suggestion to goodchristadelphiantalks at gmail.com or message us on any of our social media platforms. Thank you for listening. God bless, and talk to you next week.